I'm going to let everyone in on a secret. I am absolutely incapable of taking on an easy project. The RC Hypercar Electronics could have been a straightforward project, but no, I wanted to try something advanced, something no one had done before, and perhaps no one has done it before for a good reason. So how did I get into this whole mess? Well, I started off with a list of all the cool functionality I could think of for the electronics. You know, I wanted something powerful and flexible because I knew I probably wouldn't get it right the first time. I wanted to have all of the data logging capabilities of a full-size race car because I believe in having all the data before I completely disregard what the data is telling me. Uh, I wanted stability control, traction control, anti-lock braking, and torque vectoring because I wanted to learn how these technologies actually work and because I'm not that good of an RC car driver. And I figured if I wanted to make things unnecessarily complex, I could throw in something like active aerodynamics and have Wi-Fi. Once I had this unrealistic list of my dreams, I went into research mode, reading everything on the internet about how these technologies actually work and all of the data needed to implement them. I quickly found out FSAE Formula Electric teams had already developed all of these things and more for their race cars. So standing on the shoulders of giants, as it were, I used what they had done to compile a master list of all of the possible data I could need to accomplish this type of functionality. Once I had this master list, the next step for me was to determine how to get this data from an actual RC car. And obviously my prior experience with sensors working inside of an RC car was very valuable. But if you're trying to do this, I can't recommend enough getting the best and easiest to use possible sensors that your budget allows. It's going to save you so much time and work if you do that. The wheel encoders are a great example of this. I've tried a bunch of different ways for measuring wheel speed, and there's much cheaper and easier solutions for wheel speed sensors that don't require a custom PCB and a rather expensive magnetic encoder chip but the precision and reliability of the magnetic encoders makes the coding and troubleshooting absolutely trivial compared to the other solutions I've tried. Once I generally knew what sensors I was dealing with, I created a high level systems diagram to figure out how I would actually hook all of these sensors up. I chose to use the ESP32 microcontroller because I'm familiar with its quirks. It's super cheap. It has two very fast 240 megahertz processors and it has Wi-Fi. But speaking of the quirks, the ESP32 only supports a maximum of six SPI devices, three SPI devices per SPI bus. There are microcontrollers out there with a lot more IO than the ESP32, but then I would still need to have a second microcontroller to actually provide the Wi-Fi connectivity. And some of the processes like the SD card data logging and the GPS are somewhat slow anyways. So the additional ESP32 gives me a lot more flexibility just because I can share those tasks around in multiple cores. Because I'm super creative, I named the microcontrollers ESP32A and ESP32B. So ESP32B is the raw sensor data processing microcontroller. All of the sensor data flows through ESP32B where it can be filtered, aggregated, and transformed. Um, a great example of this is the actual wheel speeds. The wheel encoders only return an angular position of each wheel. So ESP32B monitors each wheel sensor, and if the wheel position moves more than 0.5 degrees, it goes ahead and actually calculates the RPM. And then it has some additional logic and some error handling and a little bit of filtering just to smooth out the data. Then all of that refined sensor data is actually packaged up and stored into a shared struct which is kind of like a poor man's object if you're not familiar with the programming. And then this is gonna be passed on to the ESP32A via a one megabit serial link. Now I spent about a week trying to get this serial transfer to actually work consistently between the two microcontrollers. Ran into a lot of issues, both with the speed and error handling. Sometimes it would drop out. So eventually I found an awesome library called serialtransfer.h which manages the buffering, serialization, and error handling logic and is super easy to use. So I highly recommend that. I'll put a link down in my description. So moving on to ESP32A, 
This is the actual primary controller for the RC Hypercar. It takes in the throttle and steering inputs directly from the RC receiver. It can use the data it's received from ESP 32B to implement any kind of control strategies it likes, like traction control or stability control. It then outputs the signals to the four separate ESCs and the steering servo to actually control the car. And also when the car isn't driving, it provides the Wi-Fi capabilities so that I can view some basic data like the peak lateral G's or the peak acceleration numbers and top speeds. And I can also make configuration changes from my mobile phone so that I can actually do some tuning in the field of the car. The last thing the ESP32A does is it actually logs all of the incoming and outgoing data at 200 hertz onto an SD card so that afterwards I can neurotically analyze all of the data and come back and figure out what's going on. It's been insanely helpful for troubleshooting some of the issues I've had with the car and the code. I also have a confession, uh, something that I really haven't talked about too much with the microcontrollers I've been using on the Streamliner projects and some of the other projects. I've actually been doing multi-threading of the microcontroller tasks like data logging to SD cards or reading data from GPS modules and a bunch of other things can cause delays and result in really erratic driving behavior. By default, most microcontrollers use a single processor with a single loop processing structure, meaning you put all of your code you want to run over and over again inside that loop, and it's always going to run in the exact same order over and over again. There are things like timers and interrupts, but these are all just ways of stopping that main loop and then doing something and then coming back. Multi-threading is actually breaking up all of the tasks you have for the microcontroller into smaller independent tasks, each of which actually has their own loop. Then these tasks can actually be separated out to run on one or more processing cores. To accomplish this, there's something called a process manager, which assigns all of the tasks and the resources to those tasks dynamically and actually assigns them to individual hardware processing cores based on the availability and the task's priority. The ESP32 actually has two processing cores and uses a process management framework called Free RTOS or Free Real-Time Operating System. This allows me to actually run high priority tasks like the steering and the throttle control with little to no delay, thus preventing the erratic driving that I was having and then I can run slower, lower priority tasks like data logging, either on a different core or they can round robin between whatever core is actually available at the time. So this is just a quick list of how I actually divided up the processing for each of the microcontrollers. Most of the tasks are just divided up based on their frequency and their relative priorities. Things like the wheel sensors have to be checked very fast because the wheels will be spending up to like 11,000 and plus RPM. So I need to check them at least twice per rotation. So I don't have a rollover. So it's like once every millisecond or two milliseconds, I'm checking the wheel encoders. Then we have other tasks that I just want to separate out that have a lower priority again, like the SD card logging or reading the speed from the GPS receiver and Separating those tasks out prevents any of the other tasks from being affected if they should have any delays or so they should run long. There's lots of examples on how to set up tasks with free RTOS, and it's very much a copy paste type of a code. But I do want to mention multi-threading can make your code much, much more difficult to debug if you're not familiar with how it works. Because tasks are no longer running in a set order, like they would in a loop where they would go task one, two, three, they're actually running independently so they can fire off at different times. And any type of debugging you're trying to do can trigger at different times. And it adds a layer of complexity around shared resources between these tasks. You may need to add specialized code to ensure that multiple processes aren't updating the same data at the same time. Another nefarious thing that no one talks about that got me for a good two weeks, I had endless issues with this, was that not all Arduino 
libraries play well with multi-threading. The vast majority of these libraries are written for simple Arduino microcontrollers with a single processing core. So a few of these libraries I'm using actually utilize timers internally or have other non-thread safe type code that causes the microcontrollers to crash and reboot randomly. And you don't really get any error handling when that happens. So be prepared when you start down this path that you may be digging into uh, libraries and actually having to make changes to those libraries or to your own code to try to work around some of those limitations. So once I had a high level idea of what I was doing with the electronics, I went ahead and actually laid out the custom PCBs that uh, PCBWay was going to build for me. To design the PCB, I used a product called Easy EDA, which is a relatively easy to use, if not a super powerful PCB design tool. It's great for beginner level PCBs. All of the electronics components that I used were available in the online libraries as part of Easy EDA. So I could drag and drop the ESP32 dev boards, all the connectors and the sensors onto the design sheet. Then it was just a matter of looking at example wiring diagrams for each of these sensor types and connecting the pins of the microcontroller to the separate sensors accordingly and maybe adding a few resistors or capacitors depending on what the example circuits in the data sheets recommended it was actually easier in a lot of ways than setting this up on a breadboard so that part's really worth learning if you haven't ever designed your own custom pcb i won't actually go into how to do all of the routing or adding your copper ground plates and all this other types of things. There are much better YouTube videos out there specific to designing PCBs that cover all of this material. I will note that I actually designed this shape for the wheel encoder PCB inside Fusion 360 and actually exported that shape out as a DXF. This is because these encoders just barely fit inside the suspension of the RC hypercar. And they're actually somewhat of a structural component as the motors actually bolt through the PCB and into the spindle. So once you have the actual PCB designed, uh, you can export out a Gerber file, which is a file that contains all of the information about the PCB and its layers uh, needed for manufacturing. Then the process is really simple. You can go to like PCB Way's website. You input some basic information about the PCB, like the size, the color you want, the number of layers and the materials you want. And then you can actually upload the Gerber file and it'll give you a quote right there. And it's actually really cheap for a two layer PCB like I'm using here. So once I had everything soldered up, I actually used a multimeter and double checked all the routing on the PCB. I did find that I had misrouted one of the traces. So I actually had to go in with a X-Acto knife and cut the trace and reroute it manually with just a wire. Wiring the actual PCB to all of the sensors was actually kind of a nightmare given how all the tight constraints within the RC hypercar, all the encoders use the SPI bus, which is I think six wires or five wires. Plus I had some temperature sensors that I was gonna have wired up to each of the PCBs on each of the wheels. So I found this ultra slim cat six ethernet cable that was perfect for building the wiring harnesses to the wheel sensors. And it's only four millimeters overall in diameter with eight conductors. I do need to go back and make some wire management changes for the actual monocoque of the hypercar so that I can route all the wires for the motors and the sensors and try to keep them from touching and causing any kind of electronic interference. After weeks of fighting, I actually got some code that was working well enough that I could go out and test the car. It's still running as a rear wheel drive. There's no traction control yet or any kind of differential torque running but the car is driving and all of the sensors are up and working except for the GPS, which had a soldering issue. So when I was done with the test session, it was really kind of cool to be able to see all of this raw data. Uh, I need to come up with a way to easily process it all, but right now I'm just pulling it into a spreadsheet. I want to make some video overlays and maybe even a whole like a performance testing chart like uh, Road and Track used to do for its performance cars where I measure the braking and all the other performance characteristics of the car. 
So some basic data that I was able to pull from the car, just like based on the wheel speeds, uh, the car tops out a little bit of over 70 mile an hour, which is actually a bit faster than I predicted given the crazy amount of drag the car has. It's not that much slower. I think 80 mile an hour is the predicted top speed just with no load. Uh, the other interesting thing is that when you actually let off the throttle at top speed with no braking, the drag is so high the car decelerates at 0.95 longitudinal Gs. That's quite a bit higher than most production cars reach even at peak under full braking. The deceleration rate obviously drops off very quickly as the speed decreases, but it explains why the car feels so strange to drive because you almost never have to use the brakes. You just let off the throttle the least little bit and it seems to like slow down a massive amount. And then when you actually do use the brakes, I'm actually seeing 5.5 Gs of peak longitudinal deceleration, which is pretty crazy. So obviously I really want to set up some measure tests to see how this thing actually performs like in braking and acceleration in some sort of repeatable fashion. Next time I'll have the GPS data and the front motors put in so I can actually test a baseline for what zero to 60 miles per hour looks like just based on the wheel speed sensors i am seeing a zero to 60 miles per hour in the mid two second range which is a little bit slow for what i was hoping for but again with rear wheel drive the traction is still pretty terrible so next up is actually going to be rewiring the car for all-wheel drive initially i thought it was going to be really easy to install the all-wheel drive but there are a lot more wires to route and it's you know rather large gauge wires for all the motors and there's very little space between like i said the sensors and the brushless motor wires so i'm going to have to be a little bit creative and drill some holes in the body in a few different spots to try to route those in different places so until next time stay safe out there